Thank welcome you. back, Gus. Gosh, Gus is going to be Gus is busy here. Gus is going to be doing a lot. So, um, Cynthia alluded to our training programs. Uh, showed us the website. Um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that. Um, I do want to put in a little bit of a plug. Um, next week, next Wednesday specifically, we are uh, running through our LiDAR training class. And I know a lot of the presentations that have been uh, uh, covered today have uh, shown you some of the functionality pertaining specific to point cloud processing, LiDAR processing. If you want to learn more and if you want to get some hands-on experience, there are still a couple of seats left in that class again next Wednesday it's a morning session here in the eastern US which would mean a bit of an early start for those of you west of here maybe an afternoon session for those of you in Europe um, and again uh, jump into the website that uh, Cynthia showed us and you can take a look at those opportunities most of all what I want to talk about today in the short session we have before we we take our mid-session break is uh, concerns our academic programs um, Gus has joined me because Gus is actually going to go through an example of some of the uh, materials that we've produced for for academic use so we'll get to that just a little bit just to kind of kick this off um, and I know we've covered this in in previous years if you're a return visitor I apologize we're being a little repetitive here but it is an important message um, we do uh, emphasize the importance of engaging with academia and not only in terms of how we sell our products but also in terms of how we develop our products I'm going to talk a little bit more about that in just a few minutes um, Several years ago, many years ago now, um, we noticed an uptick in the use of our applications within kind of the academic context, specifically within schools and colleges. We were, we were just noticing those uh, those sales were coming in, those users were, were, uh, were being recorded. Uh, so we reached out to some of the faculty in our local university system here in the state of Maine, the UMaine system, uh, invited them to come and have, have a chat with us to find out how we could better serve that community, the academic community. Uh, out of that came two recommendations, specifically from folks uh, you know, in academia. One being providing simple access to the necessary tools, upping the software we were producing, and the other being providing resources to simplify the uh, instructional part. So we embarked on a process at that time to develop our academic programs. I'll just bring up a couple of slides here. Um, to kind of illustrate what we're doing. Uh, one of those is academic licensing. Now, this was actually a tough sell internally. Uh, try telling uh, the sales department that we're going to be basically undermining our own revenue channels by by discounting or even giving away our software at no cost. Yeah, that, that was a tough sell, but we managed to convince uh, the folks in our sales team that it was a long-term investment, not only an investment in terms of uh, engaging students in non-traditional GIS, again, that's the best way to describe it, but also for us as a company, because as you'll see in a few minutes, um, we are constantly learning from students and from faculty about how our software is best used. I'm going to see an example of a project in just a few minutes uh, that, that, that illustrates that. So we do engage with folks in the academic community to best or to determine how best to develop our software. I mean, they teach us how to best uh, best uh, develop our software. So our academic licensing, for those of you who are in North America, you know, US and Canada, we can give you the software at no cost. Um, uh, Cynthia previewed the website, I'll, I'll pop up the URL here in a second. Um, if you want to find out more about how that works, please get in touch with her. We can uh, uh, give you more information about how to deploy that license, how to set the license up and how to provide re relatively easy access to our software. For those of you outside the US, uh, we are using Canada we're working on discounted licensing as well so we will make sure that you have the necessary uh, software licenses to allow you to use the software URL again Cynthia previewed on the website go on to the education section you'll get more information about that so again this addressed issue number one how do we get the software into the hands of our students in a simple way and again there's no easier way than allowing it to be used at, at no cost the other part of that was the academic curriculum, being, developing training materials. Now, I had come to this from the perspective of, of a trainer, a training in, in GIS. So we thought, why don't we develop materials uh, specifically for not necessarily instructing people how to use a uh, global mapper, but rather introducing the broad scope of GIS. And we like to think that Global Mapper does that very effectively because it is generally considered a relatively easy application to use. So developing materials that kind of introduce folks who are maybe not focused on GIS, folks who are maybe studying in, in a different discipline, but allowing them to be introduced to the, the principles of GIS and doing a, using Global Mapper for that purpose. So again, we do, oops. 
wrong button. Uh, we developed a, a series of uh, academic labs. I think that initially there were about half a dozen uh, lab material labs with uh, written instructions, with uh, data that we made available. I think we're up to 12 now, if I'm not mistaken, Gus, I know you're going to be looking at these more detail. That's correct. Yeah, 12 yeah. Labs. And that will continue to be developed as we introduce new functionality, some of which you've seen over the course of the presentations today. Those will be incorporated into, into more labs. So this is a, an ongoing process. So again, these labs, as Gus will show us, are, info, are um, written instructions as well as complement, uh, supplementary data. Again, URL on the, on the screen here or where Cynthia guided us earlier will give you more information on that. So at this stage, I'd like to hand over to Gus. I guess you've been kept very busy today to maybe walk through the lab structure and look at an example of how those labs work. So uh, Meg or Cynthia, if you could switch the uh, screen share over to Gus, he can guide us through that process. Thanks, David. Let me just share my screen here and just verify that the correct screen is showing. Everything Thank looks you. good, awesome. So let's have a little uh, kind of sneak peek here about if you are enrolled in the academic program, the um, academic labs that are available upon request. Um, and these cover a broad range of kind of introductory GIS topics. We have a basic introduction to the principles of GIS, uh, creating a terrain surface, just to name a few, uh, image rectification or georeferencing. Uh, the one I'm gonna be going through today, which is um, an introduction into watershed modeling. Um, one of my favorites, a suitability analysis uh, for a, a solar power project. So these cover a broad range of uh, just general or more specific uh, GIS functionality. Let's open up uh, the lab that I'm going to be covering today and kind of have a look at the structure here. So initially there's going to be some uh, basic background information outlining uh, the steps that you're going to participate in. And then the lab is broken down into uh, different sections. Um, and each section is going to kind of highlight a different uh, particular facet of whichever topic is being covered. For this example, uh, this first section, which I'm going to go over in Global Mapper in a minute, is related to uh, creating a stream paths or a drainage network from a digital elevation model. So you would generally work your way following these step-by-step -step instructions. And then once you've um, reached the end of the step, the guided um, part of the academic lab, there's another section down below here that comes with a second supplementary data set, uh, which is not um, written step-by-step -step instructions. And it is a um, opportunity to take what you just learned and apply it to another data set. And this is the part that I really find to be the most enjoyable, being able to take what you just learned and then apply it to another data set um, kind of on your own terms. So let's jump into Global Mapper here and just give a little more kind of a brief example of what some of this material entails. So this particular lab, Lab 6, as I mentioned, is related to creating a watershed model. So we're gonna be using this Create Watershed tool a lot. And in simple terms, what this tool does is model the likely locations that uh, water is going to flow on top of our terrain surface with our um, elevation model being our input data. So I'm gonna select to create a watershed area, and we can call this first one Stream Paths. Couple of the important parameters here that are going to be gone over in the um, academic lab material. Our stream threshold is a minimum flow accumulation threshold. Uh, you can imagine as you move um, from one cell to another, uh, modeling the flow of water, uh, those cells are going to be accumulating flow uh, downstream. So we can set up this minimum threshold of accumulation for those stream paths to be included in our output. We have our resolution that we're gonna perform our analysis at. This is derived from our source elevation data and our depression fill depth. So elevation uh, models tend to have kind of anomalies in the data, kind of depressions or holes that will stop flow in a way that is kind of artificial and uh, would not happen in the real world. 
So to be able to better model um, how the water is going to run on that surface in comparison to how it would do it in the real world, we can kind of fill in some of those depressions uh, to give us a better output. So I'm going to let this run here, and it's going to create my stream paths. If I use the feature info tool here, I can select a particular stream path and see that it's been given an inflow, the total number of cell accumulated um, at the beginning of that stream, as well as outflow, total number, number accumulated at the end of that stream, as well as a drainage area, the total area that drains in that particular stream segment. I can search my uh, line data here by using the search vector data tool. And what I'm gonna do here is we see we have my kind of list of results with all of their attributes. I'm going to limit this list to just areas that have a drainage, or just lines rather, excuse me, that have a drainage area that is greater than two square kilometers. So I'm selecting this drainage attribute. I'm gonna search, and now my list is limited to just um, the lines that meet that criteria. I can select all of those. I could easily copy and paste those to a new layer if I wanted to. I'm gonna turn this off. Let's create another watershed, and this time we can call this one um, watershed areas. And this time I'm gonna check this option to create watershed areas showing drainage to streams. And this is gonna create these uh, differentiating um, areas that uh, drain from to one side or another. They're typically divided by the ridge lines on your data. We'll see that how that looks once it's run. You can see that we've created these new um, watershed areas. For the next section here, we're going to talk about how our stream threshold affects our output. We're, we can call this new layer, large watersheds. And let's change our stream threshold to a minimum um, drainage area of one square kilometers. Um, and this is going to only include in our output those larger segments um, that are larger lines, rather, uh, stream paths that have a minimum uh, drainage area connected to them of one square kilometer. So we can see we have these more generalized um, watershed areas here, as well as more stream paths generated. Moving on, let's talk about one of the most common uses of uh, watershed analysis in GIS, which is the ability to model flow from a particular point, also known as water drop analysis. So I'm going to select that point with my digitizer. And again, we can jump back into our watershed generation tool. We can call this water drop analysis, if I can spell. There we go. And this time I'm going to check this option to trace flow from our selected points. And this is going to simulate, if we can imagine, if we basically poured some liquid out right here, maybe there was a leak from a pipe, or we want to figure out if liquid was released at this point on the surface, where is it likely to run towards? And we can see that it is indicated, the path it's going to take is indicated by these little arrow features. Once again, I'm going to jump uh, back. I'm going to select another point here. And this is another really common uh, GIS uh, watershed analysis, which is the ability to create a catchment area that drains to a particular point. Maybe this is the location of a drinking water source, and we want to verify um, what extent drains to that particular location. So with this point selected, once again, I'm going to open up my Create Watershed tool, and we can call this catchment. And this time, I'm only going to check this option here to create watershed areas showing drainage to my selected point. I'm going to increase my flow threshold here to account for uh, maybe my point feature isn't exactly on the line of flow. I'm going to kind of increase the resolution to look for that point. And there we go. We have our catchment area here. Now, I'm going to select this catchment area. And I'm actually going to turn on this parcels map underneath. And I'm going to, we have some pre-configured styling. I'm going to color this parcel map based on whether it falls within this catchment area. 
So I'm going to right click and I'm going to choose advanced selection options, select all um, of my features that are contained within this feature that have any overlap. So now we've selected those. Again, I'm going to right click. I'm going to edit those features. Again, we have some pre-configured styling. We have this watershed attribute that's set to no. But I'm going to edit that for these particular features and set it to yes. And we can see here now we have uh, uh, effectively added this uh, thematic mapping based on whether those parcels overlap with our catchment area. So I'm going to open up. We're getting close to the end here. I'm going to open up my terrain grid again. And one, and I'm, this time I'm going to again create my stream paths, but this time I'm going to check an option to create flow directional arrows. And we'll see what those look like once I've run it. So initially, once I have created my output here, it's going to look essentially the same from my first run, our stream paths. But if we zoom to a specific extent, we can say that we have generated this quiver plot of these scaled vector features. And these are scaled based on the uh, flow accumulation at that point, and then they are angled um, or oriented towards the detected flow direction. This is a really valuable way to have a look at the highly localized um, slope and then uh, wa water analysis characteristics of your landscape at that highly localized level. So there's one more uh, little section here I'm going to go through. I'm going to turn on this lake polygon. And I'm going to select it with the digitizer. And let's say we want to figure out if the water level increased by four meters, what would the, be the extent of that flooding or where uh, would be covered by water if we had that water level rise? This is a separate tool that functions um, pretty similarly to the watershed analysis tool available under the terrain analysis menu. So with that uh, area feature selected, I'm going to choose to simulate water level rise. Let's do four meters. We can call this four meter rise. And we're gonna increase from our selected areas. And once we've created this, we're gonna see a pink polygon that represent, represents the extent um, of water if we had a rise of um, four meters in terms of our water levels. So that's the end of the written instructions that are included in our handout. Now, once you're done with that, you're gonna have the ability to perform this exercise. Um, and for this particular example, this is going to allow you to play around with creating a catchment area that drains to the outlet of the Mississippi River, which is one of the larger rivers in the continental United States. Um, and so there's a secondary data set that allows you to um, kind of play around with that and uh, learn a little bit more about watershed analysis. Let's see, David, anything else that I'm forgetting? I have to, to say, Gus, that, 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 was, that was the fastest I think that lab has ever been completed. Amazing. Um, hope you are taking notes, folks. No, this will not be part of the final exam. No, just a great demonstration of... Uh, multi multifaceted uh, watershed as an example of one of the labs. Um, so thank you for that, Gus. Thank you for taking the time. I think you can take some time off now. You've, you've, you've done enough. <laughs> take a breath. Um, Meg or Cynthia, if you wouldn't mind uh, bringing the screen back to my side again. Just a couple of additional slides here if I can get my mouse to work. Thank you, Meg. And uh, let's see. Let's make sure we're sharing the right monitor. It looks like we are. So again, the labs of which Gus gave us uh, an example. There are 12 of them. Um, if you are uh, interested in seeing them, just uh, again, go to the website, let us know, and we will uh, be more than happy to set you up with those labs. Now, the final thing, we've got about 10 minutes left, a little, a little over 10 minutes. Um, there were drums rolling earlier for the uh, announcement of our raffle winner. We're gonna have drums rolling again in a second because we're about to announce the winner of the Blue Marble Academic Scholarship. This is something we introduced several years ago to encourage students to use 
um, our technology creatively, whether it be geographic calculator or whether it be global mapper. Uh, and I have to say, um, this is one of my favorite tasks over the year to review the submissions. Uh, it is really amazing how creatively some of the, the folks out there in academia are using our software. And you're gonna see an example of that uh, in just a few minutes. Um, obviously the scholarship for the current academic year is over. I think it ends in December. I think our closing date is December. Cindy, maybe I don't know if, you, if I've got that correct. But needless to say, we will be announcing the, uh, the academic scholarship for the upcoming academic year sometime later in the summer. So keep your eye out for that. And if, if you want to, if you're a teacher, um, mention that to your students, or if you're a student, if you've got, have done some interesting work, um, we'd love to hear from you. Um, the particulars, it's open to any graduate, undergrad, undergraduate students, or basically anybody in an academic situation. Um, we're pretty open in terms of how you submit what you've done, whether it be a, something written, a project report, poster, and we get all sorts of submissions. So be creative. We've even had folks submitting some of the, uh, the uh, Global Mapper files as part of this as well. So however you want to share what you've done, we'd love to hear from you. And again, we're a little selfish in this regard, because not only do we want to, to hear from you, but we also want to learn from you, to learn how our software is being used and it helps our developers make sure that we're keeping those tools appropriate. Um, the winner will receive a $1,000 scholarship or the local equivalent thereof, wherever you are in the world, and also a copy of Global Mapper Pro. So that's a very um, generous award that is going to be given. Now, this is where the drums are going to roll because we are lucky, I believe, if all the technology is cooperating, to have on the line our winner for the 2023-24 scholarship uh david maynard uh david are you with us today i hope you are hey david welcome from the beautiful city of aberystwyth the university of aberystwyth there on the coast of wales beautiful part of the world by the way if you ever get a yeah. chance maybe not this time of year but maybe sometime in the summer a visit aberystwyth uh david i'm not sure if you're hearing me i'm not sure we're not hearing you yep, right now. i can hear you very well excellent excellent so david uh david's uh, presentation as you can see here um on my slide replacing hand-drawn plan i'm interested in hearing a little bit more about exactly what this entails david but yeah we reviewed uh, all of the submissions we came in, and uh, to be honest, the selection process was not easy um, for those of you who submitted, and we're not selected. Um, yeah, the, really, we should have several prizes, I think, if, if we're going to do this, do this appropriately. Um, David, just before, we're going to have to hand over to you to go through a quick overview of what you've done. Uh, before we do, or while we're doing, while we're setting that up, a quick question for you. Um, and look at this, again, we're selfish here in terms of how we want to extract information, but we're always interested in, in finding out why you chose Global Mapper for for your project. What was the, what was the reason for that? Um, I used to be an AutoCAD user, perhaps 25 years ago, and then gradually AutoCAD couldn't keep up with the scale of things, and things like GPS came along, and and then I started working in different countries, so different projections and all the rest of that, and and um, Global Mapper was was a much easier program to use. So I've been using it probably since about 2008, and um, gradually working my way through it. My problem is I use it for a week and then don't come back to it for another two months or so, and I forget how to do things. I, I know that things can be done, and um, there are so many technical bits and pieces which go in there. Um, it wasn't until I came to do this uh, postgraduate course that. I actually had the time to sit down and write a complete piece of work on on using um, photographs to, to um, replace photography, uh, or uh, photographs to replace drawings, um, and actually put a proper presentation together, as it were. So, so this came along just the right time when I had a dissertation finished and um, all the slides and all the things together. <laughs> 